All right, so next is Socrates, who's another Greek philosopher from antiquity who lived around 400 to 300 B.C. Uh, he is considered one of the, if not the, most influential philosophers in Western history. Socrates is best known for his contributions to epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. According to Socrates, people did not really know as much as they thought they knew. He is infamous for approaching random people of the time, no matter what social status, from market worker to politician uh, to heads of industry, and then asking them in what areas they, they were experts. After they provided a response, Socrates would proceed to challenge everything they knew by asking them a long series of evaluative questions, and would most often come to find that the person did not, in fact, know as much as they thought they knew. This led Socrates to develop the idea of doubting oneself. This doubt should lead to curiosity, which should then lead to the individual towards self-exploration as well as exploration of knowledge. Socrates also coined the phrase that the more you learn, the less you know. This is the mantra behind his most famous saying, know thyself, meaning never be satisfied with the knowledge you have, but always be striving to, be, to better oneself through knowledge of the self and the world. From Socrates, we have Plato, who is the student of Socrates, who, like Hippocrates and Socrates, believed, that, believed and championed the idea of dualism. Plato championed this concept so much so that around the time of the European Renaissance, a quasi-religious theology developed as a result called Platonism. Platonism explained the separation of the mind and body by using a cave analogy, which is actually the doing of Socrates, but because Socrates never wrote anything down, it is attributed to Plato. Um, so this brings us to Plato's analogy of the cave and, uh, and dualism. Um, take a second, or few, uh, maybe five to ten seconds or a minute to pause the video, uh, read through the graphic here. Um, unfortunately, I do not have time in this video to explain uh, this analogy as it's pretty complicated. So we're going to save this one for class. All right. So in response to Plato and Socrates is the student of Plato, uh, Aristotle, who broke away from his teachers and argued for monism, uh, the belief that mind and body are inseparable and that knowledge is acquired through life experience. For example, we know, uh, we know not to touch the hot stove when it is on because we will get burned. We learn this through life experience when we are five years old and touch the hot stove after our mom told us not to. This contradicts dualism, which argues that knowledge is innate and derived from our mind from a previous point in time when our bodies did not yet exist. So to sum up, Socrates, Plato, and Descartes were dualists, Aristotle and Locke are monists. Wait, wait, who are those other names I just mentioned? Well, let's find out. So about 2,000 years after Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, came John Locke, the famous English philosopher, and René Descartes, the famous French philosopher of the European Enlightenment in the 16 and 1700s. These two had a similar debate on their, uh, of their own on the topic of the origin of knowledge and the mind. John Locke, in his infamous Second Treatise of Government, wrote that our mind is a tabula rasa, or a blank slate. This means when we are born, our mind is a blank slate due to the lack of life experience. But as we age and gain more life experience, we add knowledge to that slate, which is our mind. René Descartes, on the other hand, disagreed. Descartes did this by performing somewhat of an experiment on himself. He sat in an empty room with nothing but a table. His goal was to prove the existence of objects or factual knowledge without relying on his previous experiences with those objects and facts. For example, if... If our existence is only made aware to us through our five senses of touch, taste, sight, sound, and smell, our knowledge is, is, our knowledge is limited because there are natural phenomena that are beyond those five senses. So Descartes tried to prove the existence of an apple with, uh, without relying on his senses of sight. In other words, he closed his eyes and attempted to prove that an apple existed somewhere in the room by reason and logic alone, ignoring observation. Because he could not prove the existence of the apple without using his senses, he came to the conclusion that the knowledge of the apple had to have been innate, and we were born with that knowledge. Because of this, the only thing Descartes could have exist because of this, because of Descartes' reasoning, the only thing that could exist uh, is himself. He justified this in his famous saying, "I think, therefore I am." 
uh, he can contemplate the existence of himself and the universe, so therefore he must exist. Don't worry, I am expecting questions on this in class. Another Enlightenment thinker is Francis Bacon. Because of Sir Francis Bacon's contri contributions to the expansions of the fields of science, he's given the title the father of modern science. Uh, Bacon stated that the only universal principle that science can be founded upon is observation. How does one study a subject in which they cannot observe, for instance? This focus uh, on observation was combined with Locke's emphasis on learning through experience. These two theories came together to become the basis for almost all contemporary scientific inquiry, empiricism, or empirical investigation. This is the view that knowledge originates in experience and that science should therefore rely on observation and experimentation. We will explore this further in research methods before you begin your research projects. So to sum up, philosophy was the first school that questioned the origins of the mind and knowledge. The major debate was between the monists and dualists over whether knowledge was innate or we acquire knowledge through experience. The debate then developed over time leading into the Enlightenment. Surprisingly, the debate continues on today. However, due to modern science and technological breakthroughs, it has taken on a different approach. The current debate, which we will emphasize throughout the year, is one between nature and nurture. Instead of the origin of the mind being debated between dualists and monists, it is now argued between the forces of nature, such as genetic and biochemical impacts on our personality and innate behavior, and the forces of nurturing. All right. So the forces of nature, as we said earlier, like genetics, um, your, your genome, chromosomes uh, found in your body, um, your parents' genetic uh, dispositions that they passed on to you impact your personality. Well, that's the nature side of the debate. The nurture side of the debate argues that anything that we know, we have learned through experiences, through school, uh, through the soccer camps or football camps that we've attended, um, church camps, whatever. Okay? So with that in mind, where did the Spartans fall in this debate? Do they think that people's personalities and behavior are directed and guided by their genetics, or do they think that's directed and guided by their environment and how they're raised? We'll discuss in class. Well, that concludes our first unit. Hope you guys have a good night. See you tomorrow.